My name is Monk Rowe, and we're filming in Rome, New York for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. It's a pleasure for me to have Clyde Kerr, Jr. with me today. Thank you. Um, I'm glad you're up here in, uh, in the north. In, uh, right. I found it interesting that most of you uh, have been commenting on the, the nice weather. Oh, yeah, man. We won't see this type of weather in New Orleans, maybe not until January. Really? <laughs> you never know. We don't have the seasons like, you know, a long time ago, man. Right now it's very hot and humid and it's raining quite a bit, you know, it's making it crazy and everybody's eyes are on the skies. Yeah. Hurricane season, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, it is a pleasure to be up here, man. If anything's going to happen, let it happen now while I'm up here. I'm already evacuated. <laughs> but I, wish, I don't wish that to happen ever right. again right. in my lifetime or anybody else. You, know. you feel like talking about that a little bit? Sure, I'd like I, to talk I, about uh, it. You were relating how you felt luckier than a lot of people. Yeah, I um, I didn't lose my home like my sister, my daughter, my relatives, my closest friends, and everybody that I know really had 12, 15 feet of water. And some parts of it were just blown away. My house was elevated down in the section of the city, supposed to call it no flood zone, but we did have four or five feet of water. In my neighborhood, I have an apartment unit, which is on ground level on the back of my house where I had someone staying there, and I had four feet of water, but that's nothing compared to some people losing everything, their home and furniture, clothes, pictures, momentums, heirlooms, and things like that. So I was very lucky, man, you know, but just, because I made out like that, it it, it it still affected me because of the misery that caused mm -hmm. a lot of people who I loved and e other folks that uh, I'm, you know, I told my daughter, I mean, she was a single mom of four or five kids. And I really, I told her, I said, if I could trade places with you, I would do that, you know. So, yeah, I was lucky, man. But at the same time as the hurricane that we spoke earlier, my son and his wife, were stationed in Iraq, so I was thinking about the hurricane and dealing with that at the same time while I was evacuated out of town, and I didn't know what conditions were in my home at that time, so I had all that on my mind, you know, but luckily my son and his wife are out of Iraq, and hopefully they won't have to go back. Mm. My house made out okay, and uh, little by little I started getting back. I just waiting to see if New Orleans is going to recover, and have some of the flavor and the spiritual things coming back that the people bring, not the government, the city government, or the state government. Hopefully that the people, that really makes it different, that gives it that flavor of New Orleans. I'm waiting to see if that's going to happen. When you say um, the people, New Orleans has always had uh, the most amazing mix yeah. of people. Exactly. Yeah, so that's what you're hoping comes back. Yeah, to. yeah, from all walks of life, you know. Um, if you ever been to New Orleans and attended a jazz funeral in New Orleans, as you know, like some of the old time jazz musicians when they pass, it's always at that time when I attend one of those and I listen to the music. I listen to the musicians who come together to play and the singers coming together to sing and watch the people coming in from all types of walks of life. It's then that I realized why I stayed in New Orleans all my life. That particular thing, it's like with the music, with the musicians who come together to perform at this particular time. Ordinarily, some folks might not get along as well because of human relationships or whatever, but when they put the differences aside and come together, for the main purpose of, uh, uh, you know, just paying homage to the this great musician who passed, that's the purity, that's the beauty of it, you know. So if that could come back, New Orleans has a good chance of going on from there. Mm -hmm. Not so much to be like it was, but to go on and make it better, even better. But those people have to come back because they're the ones who bring that spirit and that a certain thing, it's hard to put into words, but you feel it more than you could say what it is, or but you feel it. And I remember like one of the last funerals 
I, uh, uh, I attended was a great friend of mine, an old guy by the name of Waldron Frog Joseph, was a trombone player that was good friends with my father and my uncle who played trombone back in some times, and I played a lot of gigs with him, like brunches. And he had some sons who also st are still playing. And being there in, 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 in the, the atmosphere of what was going on in that particular church, man, it's, when I talk about it, I get full. Yeah. There's nothing like it anywhere else, I bet. Right. It's true. Um, someone who's not at all familiar with the term second line or second liners, can you describe what that, how that happens and what it's like? Yeah, when, uh, when a, a person passes, uh, when they die, uh, the, the tradition is that there's a jazz funeral in which the family, has, they, we have a procession that goes to the uh, grave site and there's a brass band that's playing what we call dirges, which is a slow, very slow song. It's moving very slow and very solemn-like. It's not the time to play any happy type music because it's a sad occasion, you know. So there's a group of the family members walking in the street behind the hearse or the casket, and they're the onlookers who are marching behind them. So after the person is entombed and the family moves on and goes back home, then the, the brass band strikes up a, a lively type of tune and everybody start dancing. And there's the people, who, there's the first line with the family, the second line or the, is the onlookers. So they start dancing and having a good time because actually they see you're supposed to rejoice when a person dies and really cry when a person is born because they have to go through the pain yeah. of life, you know. So yeah. death is like a, a blessing in some ways and it makes sense, you know, it, it, it makes sense because the person who moved on, they don't have to suffer the things they have to suffer in this particular life, you know. They're going on to their reward. Mm -hmm. So the band strikes up this lively tune and everybody with the umbrellas and the handkerchiefs is having a good time and they're rejoicing. So that is the second line. How does the, um, the person's particular religion mm -hmm. kind of jive with with this, or does it make a difference if a person is Episcopalian or if he's Baptist or? Well, I don't know. I don't think so. I don't think so. Basically, the jazz funerals were sort of designated for musicians, uh -huh. so it doesn't. It didn't make any sense because you have a service going on in the church, and then outside there's another thing going on. Yeah. So whatever goes on in the church, that's that service or whatever. Outside, it has no denomination okay. whatsoever, you know. So, usually outside, there are people talking in the brass band around, waiting, and you know, just waiting for the service inside the church to come out. So sometimes I used to stay in the church if I really was close to the person. I want to be there for the services, whatever. If I I knew the person well, but not necessarily that I needed to be inside that church. To be outside is another thing to be a part of that because of the conversations that's going on outside with other musicians and people. And that's, I mean, actually, I would like to be both places. Right. So sometimes you have to make a choice of being in the church or being outside because things are happening both places. Mm -hmm. So I've been both places, you know, and man, it's, it's uh, something that happens that doesn't happen anywhere in the world, but New Orleans, the way it does, you know. I have experienced, like when I evacuated uh, New Orleans, I went outside of uh, make, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, a place called Aqua, Georgia, by one of my daughters. From then, I went up to New York to do some gigs. I was staying in New Jersey by my grandson, and I played a gig uh, the following weekend in the East Village at this uh, center, St. Mark's Center. And the feeling and the love that was in that center at St. Mark's was like, I felt like I was in the church in New Orleans because of, it was more a, a thing of poets and writers who came together to pay homage to New Orleans and the Katrina and just to 
through their words just portray how they felt about it. Some were angry about it. Some were beautiful, uh, just peaceful. I, I uh, performed after Toni Morrison, the great you know, writer, and I, man, she is one of my heroes in life. I love to listen to her speak. I love to listen to her speak just as much as I used to like to listen to John Coltrane or Miles Davis play it. What she does with the words is what the, the other music they did with the music. Mm -hmm. So I p performed right after she spoke, and it was so inspiring. And she was very calm and beautifully articulate. There were other writers there who were very angry and militant about things. I understand that's the way they felt. That's the way you play music sometimes, mm -hmm. according to how you feel. But the love that was in St. Mark's that particular day, I was thinking, say, wow. This feels like being at home in one of those churches, you know. And it was great. It was great. It wasn't the same, but it was very close because it was genuine and it was a lot of love right there, you know. So, did it affect the way you performed that day, do you think? Oh, yes, I did because um, what had, you know, what had happened to New Orleans, it, it was still happening to me even though I wasn't there. Looking at all the footage of all the people on the bridges and and the Superdome and everything, yeah, that had a, a big effect on me. Yeah. If, um, how does a young musician prepare to play with a, a band that's going to play for one of these funeral services? How do you prepare? Well, I guess you prepare if you're born and raised in New Orleans from the time that you, you come into this life, you're preparing yourself. You know, it's not something that all of a sudden happens. It's it's just a way of life. It's like the way you, it's the breath. It's in the way you walk, the way you speak. It's the whole thing, you know. So your whole life is preparation for that, you know. It's the thing that happened, and from this you go on to the next thing, to the next thing, to the next thing. As a young musician, you witness these particular things, and you aware of everything that happens and from that experience when it happens again you're that much better and it just keeps getting better and better you know if you really understand what it's all about and it's not a, it's not a thing about your ego or anything you have to put all that aside because I've witnessed musicians playing inside the church that came together with, to play for that particular purpose of that day at that service that ordinarily may not get along as well otherwise. Mm -hmm. But when they come together like that, it's the beauty, it's pure. And that music, it's, it has no, no other meaning but just to serve the purpose of what it's there for. And to me, that's one of the biggest uh, purposes of music. Music was given to us as a celebration of life. And in playing in the, in the churches, it is a celebration of life. Death is a celebration of life, you know. And it has no, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're rich, poor, black, white, or whatever, man. It's just pureness. It's like stripping you of everything you're down to your basic human nature. And so when the musicians come and play like that, that's what music is all about, you know. We've taken music and done so many things. We created industries. You have this type of music, you have rap, hip hop, jazz, all blah blah and all that stuff. And man, you know, the purpose I think that God gave us music is to celebrate life. And when you get sidetracked from that, it becomes something else and, and you defeat the whole purpose. You know, I mean, you can make a, a living in being in the music business fine, but don't forget about what it's all about. Uh -huh. Don't mm -hmm. forget about the music. Too. Right. It's well said. Um, I suspect that you've worn a lot of hats mm -hmm. in the music business. To make a living, you, oh, yeah. you have to be prepared to do oh, definitely, a lot of different yes. things. Oh, yeah, if you want to, you know, if you want to work and do, you know. Uh, I taught school for 42 years. I just retired last week, 42 years. Wow, man. congratulations. Yeah. <laughs> when I started, man, after the first couple of weeks, I said, I will never make 10 years doing this, man. So 42 years later, here I am, just retiring. So I taught, I taught, you know, my father was a teacher, my grandfather and, and my grandmother were teachers. 
my sister's a teacher. I had a couple of my, my daughters. That one is still a teacher. One's taught for three years, and she gave up. She's now a nurse. But playing music, uh, I, I started out with the whole thing. I wanted to be a, just strictly a jazz musician, but like most New Orleans musicians who wanted to just play jazz, you have to play the rock and roll rhythm and blues or brass band. So I've done all that. I played in the streets. I played in the clubs. I played in the symphony halls. I played Broadway shows. Um, I have a, you know, my degree is in music education. Mm -hmm. So uh, as a, a, a trying to be, say a, a complete musician, knowing how to read music, I was able to do things that curtail reading music and playing in, in bands and orchestras or whatever, as well as going on gigs and playing when there's no written music at all. So by being able to do that, I was able to do a lot of different things, mm -hmm. which has helped me in some way to be the type of teacher that I turned out to be, you know, to experience all those different things. That's yeah. what I brought to my uh, lessons, right. classrooms, you know. And I was very fortunate because I grew up in a home where my father was was actually a musician and a teacher. And as a kid, I can remember, I was born in 1943. I can remember as far back as 1947, on Saturdays, my father would have workshops in the living room of our home. And we had a small shotgun house, you know, straight, you know, the shotgun is. Yeah. So we had to take out all the furniture in the living room, put it in the alleyway, so these 30 to 35 musicians could get in there and play. And man, it was a big novelty for me as a kid just watching all those musicians, all those trumpets, saxophones, trombone players on Saturday. And I was just sitting on the floor and watching everybody pat their feet. But internally, I was listening to the music. And it's, it's still with me now. You know, it's what I draw from because that's part of my experiences, you know. Uh, my mother sang, she wasn't a professional singer, but she sang in church. That's how my parents met. She sang in church. You heard her sing, and that was like the beginning of me. So, <laughs> but uh, my mother had a beautiful lyrical sound. And it's a funny thing about that. Some years later, I found that my tone, my sound on my trumpet sort of has the same quality of her voice. And thinking about that over the years, probably when I was still in her womb that she was singing, I heard that voice. And I remember as a kid when my mother used to speak on the phone, I, was, I would sit next to her on the side of the bed and put my ear to her back to hear the vibration. And it all just came together many years after that, mm -hmm. that it probably was bringing me back to those days before I, I was out in the world to hear the vibrations coming. And I, I didn't know what I was doing at the time. And the way I came to realize this is uh, 1974-75, I played a gig and I taped the gig and the next day I ran into my stereo system at home. I was home alone, my family was uh, out of town or something, and the music was playing and my trumpet was playing and I was off from the room where I was playing. You know, sometimes when you get away from something you could see it better, you could hear it better. And I thought I heard my mother say something to me. So I went in the room, I said, Mom, I was wondering how she got in my house, you know, because she lived a little distance, she was living at the time. And she wasn't there, so I went back and then I heard it again. So I focused in on the tape, and I ran the tape back and I started listening a little bit more. Sure enough, man, some of the tones on my trumpet has the quality of her voice. She had a voice like a rich alto voice, and she sang she 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 wasn't a, a a jazz singer like a bop bebop and all that stuff, but she could sing a carry a, a just a beautiful pure melody, the same way Ella Fitzgerald would sing a song with the correct dish, diction and the flow of the voice. So all up until that time, I I was thinking that I got everything I have musically from my father because he was a trumpet player as well, but that made me realize, I said, wow, man. As long as I play, I can hear my mother's voice. That's a terrific story. I wonder if if uh, might be part of the reason you were attracted to the flugelhorn also. To, to, yeah. To grab that alto. <laughs> right. <laughs> I yeah. In fact, before I had a flugelhorn, I used to try to get the flugelhorn sound on my trumpet yeah. to get the big, rich, full, dark mm -hmm. sound. 
And uh, until today now, if when I'm playing, if my sound, my tone is not right, then anything I play, it's, I'm not going to be pleased with it. Mm -hmm. First of all, I got to get my sound right. Mm -hmm. And then anything I play after that, it'll, it'll, you know, I'll be pleased with it. But if it doesn't sound right, I don't care what I play. It's not happening, you know. Isn't it amazing how you, you take a, a piece of brass mm. and most trumpets are basically the same. Right. You know, you yeah. can have a little bit different mouthpiece, but you listen to the difference in, in one trumpet player to the next. Yeah. It's just unbelievable. Yeah, man. I think... Um, that has to do with the concept. First of all, I think the sound is that it's already there, no matter what you play on. You know, it's in your in your head, and that's, that's what I try to. No matter what, if I play on somebody's instrument, I'm trying to hear that, and that's the way I'm going to hear it. Uh, I have a, some friend of mine. One guy in particular was a saxophone player. He comes from a family of saxophone players. His name is Ralph Johnson. His father was Son Johnson, and he was a great alto player from the swing era and a great sound. He played with my dad. And man, I used to hear Ralph play, no matter what mouth type of mouthpiece read or whatever, or horn, he would always sound the same. So it made me believe that the sound is already here. Mm -hmm. But it makes it a little easy if you have the right type of instrument, man, you know, to, uh, to get what you're trying to get. But, you know, um, tone is everything. To me, the tone of your instrument is just like your voice. Mm -hmm. We know people by just listening to the sound of their voice, just the way we know musicians from the sound of their tone of their instrument. Yeah. When you hear a couple of notes, you know that's Charlie Parker. Right. You know that's uh, Clifford Brown. You know that's uh, John Coltrane. You know that's Clark Terry. All those great, great musicians, mm -hmm. man. So the voice is so important because when we play, that is our voice. Did your father um, or and your mother encourage you to a life in the arts? Because I know you were thinking about uh, being a visual artist right. also. Well, encouraged me in a way that they presented the home that I grew up with with all of that. Because my father was a visual artist as well, mm -hmm. and my uncles were a visual artist. So I had all that around me. I was seeing that. I was hearing the music, seeing all the drawings and the paintings and stuff. So it was there. It was just, say, like, if you want it, there it is. You make a choice. Uh, do I want to do this? Or I wasn't forced. I got my first trumpet when I was nine. And in New Orleans with the shotgun house, we had those high ceilings and the, the lights was the long string wire with a light bulb hanging from the ceiling, you know, and you would pull the string. We didn't have uh, the fixtures and the chandeliers and all that stuff. So on my ninth birthday, I woke up and from dangling from the light with my first trumpet. So man, it was a novelty for me. I had my trumpet and I was, you know, so after a few weeks, it wore off, you know. And um, I stuck it under the bed and when I went to high school, I started playing again, oh. you know. I wasn't forced to do it. My father was, was teaching me, but I felt so dumb that I did, he was such a great musician and all that. I didn't want to let him know how much I didn't know, which was crazy because, uh, you know, but he was trying to teach me and I didn't know so much I didn't know, but I was young and stuff. So what I did later on, I would listen to him practicing and playing. When he would leave, I'd go and get his books and play what he was playing, you know. So all of a sudden, boom, here I was, I was playing, you uh -huh. know. And um, on my mother's side of my family, I had great musicians who played with uh, Louis Armstrong. I had some, uh, my mother's maiden name is Baquet, which is a French name, B-A-Q-U-E-T. George Baquet was a very famous clarinet player who mm -hmm. played in the 20s and the 30s. In fact, he was one of the teachers of a great saxophone player and a clarinet player from New Orleans called, the name Sidney Bechet. You know, done. so my my, uh, my great uncle. That was your great uncle. My great uncle, oh, yeah. See. And he had brothers like Shio Bakke, who played clarinet, who left New Orleans in 1919, came up to New York, and was playing with Jimmy Durante back in those days, man. That's my great uncle. I never did meet him, but, you know, mm. that's that's part of my history, man, you know. So, I, like I say, I was, I'm rich. I don't know if I'm all that well informed, but it seems like the for some reason, 
the family connection in, in music is so strong in New Orleans. It is. More it than is. anywhere else. It's very strong, man. Yeah, because i telling some of the students today, mostly, most everyone in New Orleans family, there's somebody who plays music. Say, for instance, like Kid Jordan, he's the head of our uh, jazz camp, the Royal Armstrong camp. His, he has a son who plays flute, a son who plays uh, trumpet. He has a daughter who plays the violin and another daughter who sings. And, and these other three kids, uh, they have something to do with music, but they're not, you know, they don't play. Uh, the Jordan family, and there's the uh, kid is married into the family called the Chatters family in New Orleans, with 16 brothers and sisters, and all of them played. Now, in our jazz camp, we have the young grandsons of those kids, they're coming up, so it's like the cycle is moving on. Whether they become professional musicians, we don't know, because they're like eight, nine, ten years old, you know, but mm -hmm. they're being exposed to it. If they want it, it's there, you know. Well. Did the um, Musicians' Union have much to do with the day-to-day -day music that was going on in New Orleans during your career? Yeah, they had something to do with it. Yeah, they had something to do with um, But, I mean, it was just so much that they were doing that if you wanted to make some money, I mean, you had to do what they were, you know, what they could provide for you and then do other things too, you know. Yeah. So it's like being non-musicians, you know. <laughs> yeah. Like most gigs I played coming up, man, I was I played with a band that more more than half of the band were not in the union, but it was fun. I was, we were making right. gigs and making money. One time I got busted for playing with the guys, and I had to go before the board and, oh, what you doing? You know, but it was, I don't know, it was crazy, man. I wanted to say, well, what do you expect, man? I got a family. I got at the time I had two kids. I have three all together. I said, I need money, I gotta work, you know, and because you know, teaching school in New Orleans, man, that's poverty level, you know, really? that's a shame, man. that's yeah. a damn shame, excuse uh, me, I can say that on tape, yeah. I have to bleep that out. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, and then I was having fun because mostly my my comrades that I was playing with, you know, I, I used to do some union gigs with the bow tie and all that, you playing, you know, yeah. dinner engagements and stuff like that, man. That was cool. That helped pay, pay the bills. It helped me to uh, to do what I wanted to do later on in my life, you know, and not not do type of gigs that I don't want. I don't have to play music right now if I don't want to because, mm -hmm. like I said, I'm retired from teaching. Yeah. So you know, I don't, I don't have to get out there and, and bust the pavement trying to do gigs, man. And I'm more selective now when I play, and because. Uh, I just I just don't have to be out there, and it's, it doesn't feed what I need to right now because the scene has changed so much. Uh, when I play now, I want to really get full enjoyment out of what I mm -hmm. what I do. I don't have to do a gig and me watching my watch. Man, when is this over with? You know, <laughs> I hate that man. Oh, yeah, geez, it like seems like the time is standing yeah, still. Yeah, I mean, look, I can never look. I can uh, spend a week in hell, man, <laughs> and for a three four hour gig. And like, oh Lord. You know, yeah. I want to feel good about playing music, you know, mm -hmm. and I want to walk away from that feeling fulfilled in some kind of way. That's yeah. what I need to feel, to feed my creative spirit, mm -hmm. you know. I like playing in church, you know, because playing in church these days, I mean, you have an a audience, that you, you don't have uh, people selling drinks, people are not smoking, people are not talking. And a lot of clubs in New Orleans, man, there's so much noise in there that it's hard to to concentrate. When I was a young musician and I played in places like that, it didn't matter because I really was trying to play. I was listening and trying to get things together. I'm still trying to play because I won't ever get to the point where I say I have it all because mm -hmm. I know I never will. But I hear the noise now and I hear all the talk. I hear the clatter of glass and drinks. I hear the the mixture of the machines making the drinks, so it's like a slap in the face. When you play in church, you have a captive audience, uh -huh. you know, and it's a great place to play, man. And it's funny because uh, when I was coming up, you couldn't play jazz in church. It was just jazz in the church, you know. Yeah. But uh, some, like within the last 10, 15 years, I remember once I was playing in the church and I was playing uh, a tune or something I wrote. 
I said, wow, man, I'm playing this music in church. You know? I said, wow. It just hit me all of a sudden. Times have changed, you know. Yeah. And people appreciate it. And why not? Because I offer up all my, uh, my playing to the creator who's given me the talent, you know. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. Nice. Do you have any session, any of the session work that you've done that sticks in your head is particularly memorable? Oh, quite a few of them, man. The ones that I did, uh, like from, let's see, from the late 60s up to the end of the 70s, even into the 80s. But I had a friend of mine who was a saxophone player. He died in 78 of lymphatic cancer. And we did a lot of sessions together in New Orleans. There was another trumpet player. His name is John Longo, who left New Orleans and went to play with the Ellington Orchestra. So it was John, Alvin Thomas, the guy who died and myself, that we did a lot of sessions with people like Pat LaBelle. And uh, we did one with uh, Paul McCartney when he was in New Orleans, that album Venus and Mars. Uh, we did things like with the Neville Brothers and a group with the funk, with the Meters, mm -hmm. which is a popular funk group. They, you know, they're still around, but they, they're not all together like they were, the, the original members, you know. But back in the 70s, man, they were the, one of the mm -hmm. high bands. We did a lot of, uh, like, New Orleans-type kind of grooves, uh, hip hop away and things like that. So those are precious memories there, you know, mainly because Alvin is gone and John is uh -huh. somewhere else. But I've done a lot of things with other musicians, too, that, were, that stick in my mind. But the, those sessions that I did with, they were like my brothers, man, were special. Oh. I was poking around on the internet, and I, for some reason, I saw this thing about Lady Marmalade. Yeah, and that you was, played on that. Yeah, I played on yeah. that. Pat LaBelle. I did two albums with her. Uh huh. Yeah, that was the one I was talking yeah. about. I was thinking about. Yeah. You just show up, and the music's there, and, and you gotta like. Right, you gotta read it. it. That's right. what I'm saying about being a reading musician. Mm -hmm. You could you could react when there's written music, or I've done a lot of sessions when there was no music. You have to just from here or sometimes they gave you the part from the piano mm -hmm. and you put it together and you know to be able to do it all man means that you're able to uh, do more things you know mm -hmm. like in New Orleans at the Jazz and Heritage Festival back in the games when I was playing quite a bit sometimes I play in the economy hall which is the traditional jazz Sometimes I'd go to what it was the Ray Band stage and that was the rhythm and blues with Dr. John and uh, Alan Tucson and people like that and and I would go to the jazz tent, play my gig, play with Kid Jordan, play with Ellis Marcellus or whatever and then go to the phone stage and play with groups. So I sometimes I would do all that in one day. And people would ask, well how can you go from one stage to an another stage, play the different styles? I say, man, I think it's, it's just like one thing to me mm -hmm. because everything comes from the breath. When you blow your horn, you know what your surroundings about, so you just make it go like that. Mm -hmm. So if I'm in, the, I mean, if I'm playing with, uh, if I'm playing with, with with the Neville Brothers, I'm not going to play the same way I would play when I'm playing in the Economy Hall. But it's the same thing, you know. It's the same thing. But so you you just make your instrument sound to blend into the surroundings mm -hmm. that you are, you know. It's just like going through neighborhoods in New Orleans. You know, you go through different neighborhoods yeah. and you see the culture may change a little bit, this, that, or whatever, and you react to that. You do it automatically. Sometimes when you hang out with your friends, you might speak a little different, use a little bit other terminology yeah. that you can't put on tape, you know. <laughs> when you go into other surroundings, you, you, you know, you react differently, you mm -hmm. know. So it's, it's all a reaction to what's going on at the particular time. Mm -hmm. To me, and that's what jazz is to me, you're reacting in the moment of what is going on and what's supposed to be happening at that particular time, you know. Is that the hardest part? Well, let me rephrase. Mm -hmm. What's the hardest part for you to teach to younger players about improvising or music in general? The hardest part? Um, well, one of the things that was hard was that uh, a lot of the young musicians were losing their own identity in copying 
the style and the notes that other musicians were playing, you know, in the beginning. So I would tell them, say, man, that's great what you're doing, but it's a time we have to let that go and start trying to get your own voice, your own style. And some of them, till this day, still haven't gotten away with, from copying whoever they were listening to at the particular time to find their own voice and their own style. Mm -hmm. I mean, you have to do that sometimes, you know, to get to where you want to get, but you got to know when to hold them, when to fold them, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know. And uh, for me, like I said, uh, I was I was just so fortunate that I had so much experiences, not only just with the music thing, but my life in general. Because I, I, I don't draw just from my musical experience, I draw from my whole life mm -hmm. and try to bring it together. And I always talk about the point. The point is the time that you're in right now, the moment. So this right now, we're, we're at this point of our lives, all three of us here. And so from that we're bringing out experience of who we were yesterday and the day before that to this moment. And from that you can react to a certain things because you have that history to draw from. And that's what I used to try to teach those kids uh, who didn't know when to let it go and say, okay, well I got that. Okay, let me see what I can do with it to make it mine, to make it sound like if I would give them an idea because I never did like to teach cliches or licks as we call them. Mm -hmm. I would use certain things as a means to getting to other things. You know, say, okay, I'll give you this. Okay, now let me see what you're going to do with it. Some of them would take it and develop it and turn around so so much that I wouldn't even recognize myself, which that's the purpose. Yeah. Some of them are still playing the thing the way I gave it to them, you know. Like, um, I taught Nicholas Payton as a young musician. He was at home. He's in New Orleans right now. We were still talking, and and man, he's taking it gone, and it's his now, you know. Yeah. And other great musician as a young trumpet player, Christian Scott. He's out there. He just have, uh, has a brand new CD out, trumpet player. But a lot of people associate me with just teaching trumpet players. But I had drummers, piano players, bass players, guitar players. You know, and they all like family, and a lot of them still keep in touch. Yeah, after so many years. You know. That's terrific. I know your name shows up a lot um, if you're looking about uh, other musicians, and they was a student of. Yeah, know, is your name a lot? Yeah, yeah, that, man. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was blessed with uh, having been in that particular si situation of teaching at the art school in New Orleans. Um, Half of my career has been in like a regular band director capacity, which mm -hmm. I used to hate because we had to do football games and parades <laughs> and all that stuff, man. I did it, but it wasn't my cup of, you know, I had good concert bands. But once I started teaching at the art school for the last 20 years or so, it's like when it all came together for me. And But I use all that experience to bring to, uh, the situation I was in, whatever I'm in, you know, because when I got to the school, the uh, New Orleans Center of Creative Arts, at first I didn't know how to, well, what to do. So I was trying to teach a certain way, and it took me maybe a year or two years to really realize that I have to teach from my own experiences, you know. So once I started doing that, it took off, man. You know, I had to teach for my life because there are a lot of musicians or t and teachers, rather, who are trying to teach certain things and they didn't even live the life, so they don't even know what the, you know what what it is. You know, right. you got to be out there. You have to have those experiences because you have to have something to draw from. And there, some of them are teaching from what they read in the book. Or Which whatever. there are an awful lot of books now. Oh aren't yeah, there? there's a lot of books, man. See. There, there weren't any books like, well, no, there weren't any books like that when I was coming up or how to, now there are a lot of books, but that could serve you well if you know how to use them. But at, like, at some point you have to get away from the book. You have to get away, take the knowledge in the book and turn it inside out. Like today, and I've always taught about printed music, printed music has the function of being able to play from the top of the music all the way down, mm -hmm. no mistakes, 
understand everything about the rhythm, the phrasing, the dynamics, everything about it. Okay, that's one thing. The next thing from printed music, you can take things out of contact and make them your own, just what's written already. And I found myself doing that as a young musician, and at that time, I didn't know how valuable it was because I used to play out those exercise books I was talking about. And before I started really trying to improvise, I used to play all the exercise straight down, you know. And then when I started listening to more jazz, people like Clifford Brown and Miles, I would play something out of the exercise books and I'd get to one little phrase and it sounded like, hey, that sounds like something Clifford Brown would use or play because he had that classical background and it, you know, he played jazz, but his jazz was were classical solos, the way he approached the trumpet. So I find myself taking a measure or a phrase in fifteen, twenty minutes I'm working it in and out, trying to turn it inside out, and all of a sudden, oh wait a minute, I gotta get back to the book. But later on I found say, wow, that was very valuable. That nobody told me to do that because when I went to school, man, you couldn't really play jazz mm -hmm. in the practice rooms. I'm sure that was happening all it was happening all over the country. I went to Xavier University and in the practice rooms when I was trying to play a Thelonious Monk thing on the piano and every time I hit the tritone, the nuns were now going to do, Mr. Kerr, now this is for serious music. You can't play that in here. I said, well, sister, I'm serious. <laughs> you know, but it was uh, like that. You know, you couldn't do that, man. But um, even teaching in the uh, jazz like I wound up doing, I didn't go to school for that, mm -hmm. but I took my school was out there right. doing it out there. In the, That's uh, right. Uh, mm -hmm. And a student is lucky to have someone who's been out there. That's what I think anyway. Exactly, yeah. man. You know, like the old the older musician who were in my living room when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. As I grew up and got older and started going out there, they treated me with the same love that my dad gave to mm -hmm. them. You know. Your father was uh, credited somewhere. I've uh, called him the father of New Orleans big band. Is yeah, we know like some of those terminology. Yeah. yeah, I would, I would give him credit for, for doing that. Actually, he was one of the people who started music education in the schools. Okay. You know, not only big band, but he was one of the founders of. There's a book called Changes on the Chalkboard by uh, Al Kennedy. Changes on the Chalkboard. I think it's Shawnee Press if you ever need a good book. And it deals with music education in the Orleans Parish School System. And my father was one of those who was very instrumental in getting it together. Now, he graduated from Xavier University with a degree in English and science. And that's what he was teaching in the beginning of his career. But he wound up teaching music for the most, most of all his life in, in the school system. But uh, his approach to music was from the same type of mindset of a science and uh, mm -hmm. a science teacher, you might say. He taught uh, at a school in North Booker T. Washington in 1947. The principal at the school didn't like jazz, so he didn't want him the band. But he was teaching English and science, but he also had the band. So what he would do, man, he would take a Duke Ellington tune and put it in a symphonic type of form or you know, arrangement. So he was able to play that, and this guy didn't even know the difference, man. You know, you know, I was back in the jazz was a bad word, man. You know, yeah. it's devil's music and all that kind of dark. stuff. You know, even so, in New Orleans. Oh right? yeah, man, it's just crazy, you know. But yeah, my father did a lot with big bands, and he loved Duke Ellington, uh, Fletcher Henderson, and um, Jimmy Lunsford band, and he taught himself how to write music and arrange and for big bands and. Man, some of his music <clears throat> was at my sister's home in, in the shed that was outside. And I have, I have about a third of that at my home, but oh. that part of my house was all wiped out by the oh, storm. Man. She lived by the London Avenue Canal. And when that water came over, it just pow, knocked it out. Not only the music, but tapes, yeah. photos, and albums, and all that stuff, man. Just, it's like a life, and, and his thing was always handwritten, so it's like, a monk in the monastery copying yeah. the scripture. He had a beautiful penmanship, man. But I have some of his music. Really and, uh, some of 
uh, went to Chicago in, in, in the first part of April, and, and uh, we played a couple of his, uh, one of his original compositions and arrangement with the Chicago Jazz Ensemble with John Farris. And they, they really loved it. He's nice. some beautiful music, man. Nice. I was blessed. Yeah. I have a little piece of music for you to sure. listen to. Okay. Uh, let's see if it sounds. Uh, Alvin Red Tower. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that bring back memories, man. That's that's a great moment there. I mean, as yeah, you said, man. everybody's in the moment and they're listening to yeah, you and they're man. reacting. Yeah, it's funny, to it. man, about that particular. That was the title of the album. I forgot what it was. Uh, the name of uh, the album was it was with Red Tyler, Red Tyler yeah. with on round the label. Red Tyler was one of those musicians that was in my living room mm -hmm. in the forties, and this particular tune, the guy was from uh, Boston, that's where the round the label. And the first when we first started playing that tune, man, my chops was good. I was playing high, I was playing all this, but I didn't know what the what the what the producer was looking for, so we did about. 15, 16 takes okay. one day of that particular tune. And it wasn't enough. When we came back, we did almost that same amount of uh, that day. So to me, when you start keep repeating it, it's, instead of going up, it goes down, a lack of interest and uh, uh, just the energy. So that particular take, man, it was one of those that, uh, I mean, it was okay the way I played on it, but I wish it had taken the first couple of them. But it wasn't my record, so it was the saxophone player. He had picked the one that he liked best. But, you know, jazz music wasn't created under the ideal situations. It came out of a lot of, a lot of diversity and stuff like that. So with all the mistakes, even I remember it was a, a critic in Boston when they first heard that said, yeah, the trumpet player missed the note or something like that. But he didn't know how many times I played that song yeah. and my lips were getting tired, man. He played a brass <laughs> instrument, man. So, but I still love it because it shows my human quality. Mm -hmm. I'm not perfect, mm -hmm. you know. Is it possible to explain to a student what you think about when you're improvising? <clears throat> Yeah, I I, uh, I try. Yeah, I try to, to explain things like that. And again, I always refer to my artwork, you know, because to me, music is, and to put it simply, is straight line, curved lines, and dots, mm -hmm. just like looking at a painting. You see some type of straight line. You see some type of curved line, and you see the dots. The straight lines refer to the scales, the curve line, well, let's say the curve lines or stuff like some type of scale, the straight lines or the arpeggio. So music goes this way, music goes up and down, and then you have the dots I talk about is from an interval standpoint. Hmm. You know, so when you look at a picture, like the picture on the wall, you see, you see all that. And when I learned about Miles Davis some years after I was listening to that, he was a great artist, and Miles said, I'm not a trumpet player, I'm a visual artist, and the trumpet is my brush. I said, wow, that's the way I think about it. And once I, I say, I'm on the right track, you know. So I, I try to, um, you know, since music is such an abstract thing, I try to paint pictures in my teaching and use a lot of analogies to paint some type of picture in the kid's mind so they can see. Now, most of them, they, they can get that. But if I'm teaching a kid like who more left brain or, or approaches me from an intellectual, then I have to use some other kind of approach because they're the ones who have to see it written on paper. Yeah. See, I'm more right brain, that's the more creative side, but I take it from here, put it over here. <laughs> I can do that. Uh -huh. Some people can't take it from here and put it over here. It comes out the same way here. So somewhere in between is where you want to bring it all together. Now my father, my father was very disciplined, but he was like a le more of a left-brain type of person. 
he had the discipline to sit down and work things out and get it. So he really wasn't a, 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 a say an improvisationalist, so to say, because he dealt with with form and and th and, 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 and uh, what you call it. Uh, uh, with, with rules and things like that. Mm -hmm. That's the way, you know, that's the way doctors are. A lot of doctors are like that. He was. He went to school, he wanted to be a doctor and then didn't have enough money, so he went to English and science. Wound up teaching music, though. But his more was left brain, and so his approach to music was very disciplined, like Mozart and Beethoven, all those guys who could learn how to write music and you didn't need a piano. You heard it all, and you know the rules and the formulas. That's what I wanted to say. He had he learned all the rules and formulas. He he transcribed a lot of Duke Ellington music and found out how to blend the instruments mm -hmm. to get a particular sound that he wanted to do. So he heard that all in his mind because wow. he had the formula, like to write for a clarinet when they're playing in the in the upper register or with a muted trumpet in between, uh, maybe a, a baritone saxophone. But the combination of sound and timbres of of each instrument that was that was something there man that was amazing man you know? couldn't have picked anybody better than Ellington to do that too. oh yeah man because Duke in Duke's music is it was the music was telling the story you could hear it in the music you know Jimmy Luntz with too you know there's a, a thing he did on stormy stormy weather and and uh, Jimmy Luntz with you could hear the storm it's sort of like some of the music that Richard Strauss did like uh, programmatic music. You can hear the yeah. story mm -hmm. in the music. I remember Joe Allen Spiegel. Yes. You, you know the story yeah. about that. You can hear all that, even when he goes to the gallows, man. <laughs> it's all in the music. It says something. So you can hear it in the arrangement. I want to learn how to do that through my improvisation, spontaneous, mm -hmm. because that I didn't have the I, I didn't have the discipline to sit. I've written big band music charts. But I've done a lot of things by head uh -huh. at, at, in the classroom, you know. I wanted it quick and fast, man. What happens when a student comes to you and... I, this has happened to me. They ask me about something that I don't use and that I actually don't know that much about. I mean, it could be modes mm -hmm. or it could be certain kinds of, you know, they ask me, when when do I use an enharmonic an scale or something? Yeah. And I don't use them. so. I'm sometimes stumped as to what to say to that person. Well, I always tell them, look at the notes that are involved. I mean, the notes them, themselves give you the answers. And what it comes down initially to, how does it sound? Because the ear is the final mm -hmm. judge of that. You know, and you may go by the rules all the time, but I mean, a lot of rules have been broken because this sounds a certain way. And if it sounds right, then it's right. Mm -hmm. And if that's the way you want it to go, nobody can dispute that from you. Say, well, that's what I meant to do. That's the way I want it to go. And say, okay, that's it. It's yours, you know. Um, I try to give them many different ways to approach things, but I would say look at the notes that are involved and hear the sound. If it sounds right, then it's right. Yeah. You know, that's it. Right. You know, Because you can get caught up in the rules and regulations so much. And if we did that all the time, you would never have had a, a Louis Armstrong, Charlie Parker and all that because they went beyond the rules. Mm -hmm. I mean, Debussy and Ravel and all those guys, they they broke the rules of the, the guys before them and they weren't popular at their particular time mm -hmm. because they were using whole tone scales and all the sound that they were using, man. And thank God for that, you know. Otherwise, everybody would sound the same, you know. You gotta follow your own your own instincts, in other words. Because I really believe education, no matter if you're teaching music, you're teaching science or math, you're trying to teach a person to think and make judgments for themselves. You know, once you do that, then you've done your job. I want to give you enough information so when you get out on your own, you can make the most logical uh, judgment and, and decision for yourself. And that's what it's all about. I said this today with, uh, with the kids, you know, I could tell you, I give you clicks, uh, uh, cliches and all that, but like the thing is that you can feed a man, but if you teach him how to fish, then he can feed himself. So 
we're trying to teach these youngsters how to think. And to me, the, the, the overall thing in this country is they don't want education to work because they don't want people to think for themselves. Because once you start thinking, you can see all the bull that they're trying to pull on you. You know, you may have a PhD, but if you can't really think and see, I mean, you go for anything, man. So I don't think, especially with the arts, if you're dealing with the arts and you're really dealing with the arts and you're looking for the truth, you're always looking for the truth, then you're going to see everything. So if we keep the people from becoming artists and being able to think and develop their own expression, then you can control them some kind of way. Just because it's in the paper or you see it on TV doesn't make it right. You have to see that and try to figure it out for yourself. You know. Mm -hmm. So I think education in general is to teach a person to think and make the correct decisions for themselves. And, and especially with jazz, in a moment, and it's going by like that, you have to think quick and you have all these possibilities that can go in that particular moment, but this is what I choose at this particular mm -hmm. time. And then once it's out, I say, well, there it is. Yeah. And if you record it, there it is, you know. <laughs> we can't say, okay, well, let's do it again. You can do that in the recording studio, but if you're playing a live performance, right. you can. I told the kids that, they said, wait a minute, stop the band. I didn't mean to play that. Start again, you're right. in the nightclub, you can't do that. That's right, you have yeah. to learn how to deal with what you might have thought, well, I didn't mean to do that, but right. now I'm going to make it sound like I did. Right, but, and that's the thing, to learn how to recover and to react mm -hmm. to your mistakes, and that's how we learn. We don't learn from doing the same things over and over again. I've learned more from the mistakes that I've made that has helped me to be, become a better teacher mm -hmm. because I know what you're going through, I know what you're doing because I, I've done that. So I could tell you what you need to do to kind of correct that or whatever. But it's beautiful. I think Miles Davis's style was more out of his, uh, his weaknesses than his strengths mm -hmm. as he developed, you know. I mean, in the beginning he was sound like Dizzy Gillespie when he was hanging around Charlie Parker and those guys. But sooner or later, Miles started developing into these things. And from the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, 70s, 80s, up until the 90s, Miles was changing, man. He didn't stay the same. I know. know. It just seemed like when you got into what he was doing, he was on to something. He else. was a true artist, man. Mm -hmm. You know, I think he was really a true, not only with music, but fashion and yeah. visual art. Yeah, he was what I call a true artist. A lot of people didn't like what he was doing toward the end, but I loved it. I, 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 I love it, man. I love Miles, man. You know. You know, I think the average person that when they think of New Orleans music, they probably typecast it into well, yes, I know Dixieland jazz came from there, and yeah, maybe a little. The Neville Brothers. Something I have. I don't know. If, I, I I count myself in this category mm -hmm. that I didn't realize how much different kind of things were actually coming out of New Orleans. Right, and even now, <clears throat> as we try to rebuild and regroup, there's been a part of New Orleans music and New Orleans culture, for instance, that has not been embraced, and mainly is the really avant-garde sort of say. I don't like the word, but. Mm -hmm. That type of musician, the kind of musician Kid Jordan is, yeah. the kind of musician I, 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 I am too, because I can do that as well as play, you know, because it's all the same thing. But unless you sound something like Louis Armstrong or whatever like that, man, it, it's like you, it doesn't matter. It doesn't really, you, whatever you do, it doesn't matter. With the uh, improv improvisational arts quintet, that's the group I play with Kid and Alvin Fielder. Um, we get on the bandstand, sometimes we may not see each other for a year or so, and we just get together and start playing. In the beginning of that group, we used to play charts and stuff. Well, not charts, but heads of tunes. Mm -hmm. After you play the head, then you're off on your own. Yes. But now we don't play that no more. We just show up and react among ourselves. and that's. To me, that's the whole essence of improvisation. It's no cards, no particular form. You just make it up as you go. And when you can come together and you have those moments like that, more, you can't beat that, you know. But New Orleans hasn't embraced that. To me, I think New Orleans is confused or they care to look at the, 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 real, the real thing about playing traditional music, creating music, and, or creating music 
in the tradition that it was created. What I mean by that, if Louis Armstrong wouldn't have taken the initiative to take it further from the guys who he was listening to, he would we would never know about him. Mm -hmm. So traditional music is playing the way it was, or the way, you know, in the beginning. Playing in the tradition is to take something that's been done already and bring it forward. Do you think any, there's economic considerations there, like tourists aren't going to come to New Orleans, or when they come, they want to hear the traditional mm. music, what they're expecting? Not really, because there are a lot of tourists that have come to New Orleans and have heard things like that. Say, man, I've been looking for that all day around here. I didn't know that existed in New Orleans, you know. It's just that it hasn't been exposed because the people who were trying to make money off you don't think they can make enough. But they, like I was going to say, at the Jazz Fest, when we started playing uh, 25, 30 years ago, the tent, the jazz tent, would be full from the act before us, yeah. and when we would play 10 minutes, that tent would be empty. Mm -hmm. The only people who left would be our family members, you know. Oh. But over a period of time, man, the tent has grown, and people are want, they want to hear that because it's, an, it's, an ex, it's a new experience. It's a thing that makes them look within their own minds and try to understand what's going on. You keep hearing the same old song. I am so tired of playing some of those I love the music, but I'm tired of playing. I don't want to play some of those same old traditional. I don't want to play when the saints go marching in. I love it, but there are enough other people playing. I don't want to do that, mm -hmm. you know. And I want to play my thoughts. I want to be honest about it. I want to play how I feel, you know. Some days I feel this way, some days I don't. And that's one of the decisions I made, like coming out of college and trying to get a career in classical music as a jazz, and I thought about it. So okay, on a day I might not feel like playing this part I have to play in the orchestra. You know, I'm being honest with myself. So I pursued the jazz because I could play it the way I felt. If I didn't feel like playing a high note, I didn't have to play that note. I could play according to how I felt at that moment. Yeah. And I was being true to myself. And I played with a lot of phone bands, which I learned a lot, even though I was playing Funk music. I was on the bandstand, always concentrating about playing my instrument correctly with the correct attack, the correct air, the correct sound. So it wasn't up there. I was just dancing and having a good time, man. I was still learning music, and I learned a lot because I was, I was around mm -hmm. great musicians too, you know. Well, yeah. Well, you have told me some fascinating things. It's oh, thank you. Great. Yeah. Um, I want to wish you the best of luck with uh, being part of New Orleans coming back. You know, that's going yeah. to be a big thing. Well, you know, I feel if I'm not a part of it, I've done my, I've done my do. You know, I'm 63 years old. Yeah. And I taught for 42 years, and I played music for about 45 years. So if there's anything I can do, I, you know, I, I think I would do it. But... Um, I told enough young musicians who are out there that they will be playing for the next 40, 50 years, and I had a part to do with that, you know. So if I can do anything, I would like New Orleans to open its mind and its ears to other things other than just, you know, what it's been doing. And uh, toward, toward, like, toward the end of our gigs at the Jazz Fest, We've had full tents. People, have, they come looking for us now. But like last year, we weren't hired to play because they figured there wasn't any room for that particular type of music. Even my group wasn't hired. Again, I don't know, you know, the people in charge, it's no big deal, it's not my festival, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't have to be there. Right. But they, they would say, well, you know, your music sounds a certain way. In other words, my music is not valuable enough to bring people mm -hmm. or the the group with kid. We are such a different type of band that we don't have a place there. And that's crazy, man, you know, because that's the way mu New Orleans music came about. Mm -hmm. It came about by new ideas, you know. If people like Louis Armstrong, Sidney Bichet, and all those early musicians, and if they didn't take it further 
from the time they were living, you never heard about, heard of them, you know. So, if anything, if, if I would like to see New Orleans just open up and embrace the beauty and the, the, the things and the people that are there to make it better than it was before, you know. Because there are some young musicians who like, one of my students, Nicholas Payton, he's, he's really looking into this free expression, avant-garde type of thing. He's done, I mean, if you listen to and follow his career and all the records that he's, he has recorded up to this date, he did a, uh, a sequence of development of music from the beginning, mm -hmm. the early styles of Louis Armstrong to the modern jazz to the electronic thing, and now he's, you know, so I'm glad to see that he's doing that. I mean, he could be comfortable in playing like Louis Armstrong, everybody would praise him and bow down, mm -hmm. yeah, Lord, you know. <laughs> But he he decides that he needs to be true to himself and, right. and needs to do something else. Just like Christian Scott. He's playing the way he wants to play. He's doing what he wants to do. And he's getting a lot of play now, you know. So you have to be, to be comfortable with yourself. You have to feel that. And, you know, there's other people doing things. As long as they're comfortable, that's what they want to do. That's cool. Yeah. That's for them, you know. Uh, it's cool. That's yeah. cool. So um, I hope New Orleans could come back. I hope it could be better. Yeah. It's a lot of corruption there, man. It's a lot of jealousy. It's a lot of uh, small-mindedness. But, man, things are going on. And even before Katrina, things were going on like in Houston and Atlanta that was flourishing, even on the Gulf Coast, you know. And even with the educational system, man, the music uh, thing in New Orleans was suffering even before Katrina. So if we're going to come back, we have to take it from the best part of those years and bring it into something else because our kids deserve that. Yeah. It hurts when you see kids uh, who are playing like they never had instruction in their life. And they go to school, and they're taking music classes, but they're not getting the right information, you know, for whatever reason, you know. Yeah. So I would love to see New Orleans become what it should be, what it, you know, a beautiful place. Maybe you ought to get into politics. <laughs> You've got a lot no, to say. got a lot to say. See, with politics, <laughs> yeah. see my nature, man, I know myself. Yeah. I want to be cool. I want to be, you know, relaxed and all that. So either I'm going to be like this or there's the other side. Yeah. There's no in between. Yeah. So if I'm going to deal with some of that other thing, man, I don't know what I might right. do. So I try not. I already have high blood pressure and take a lot of medication. Okay. I don't need to deal with the politics, yeah. man. Well, Somebody else could do that. After all you've done, you deserve to take it easy. And yeah, and choose your time. gigs, as you exactly, said. Exactly, man. Right. Choose okay. my battles. Right. right, that's true, man. Well, it's been a real yeah. pleasure for me. Uh, me too, man. Yeah. I, um, you know, like this this whole interview thing is the same approach I do when I when I play. You don't know, have an idea what you're going to play. I didn't have a script, you didn't have a script, or you had some ideas with questions mm -hmm. you made, but I walked through the door. I didn't know what was going to happen. Right. I don't know what key we were going to be talking <laughs> in. <laughs> so that's the way I like to react to life. Right. You know, just, okay, let's see what's going to happen. Right. And when it's all over and done, I hope you don't have to do too much editing <laughs> <laughs> or whatever that, uh, that's the same way we're playing music to have the flow and the voice and just, and when it's all over, you can see how it's all connected. Yeah. I, as a kid, when I used to play on Saturday mornings, man, I used to love, like when I was a kid, I had the little plastic cowboys and Indians and the soldiers. And Saturday mornings, man, it was beautiful. I'd wake up and I'd fix the covers of my bed to make it look like the mountains. And I always had a great imagination. So I would start my little stories with my little toys, whatever, and play and from the beginning, a story would unfold. I didn't have a script. And then sometimes the Indians would win, sometimes the cowboys would win, sometimes everybody would get wiped out. But when it was all over, it was like a story with a beginning, a middle, and an ending, just like the Long Ranger or whatever, yeah. or some of that stuff back in those yeah. days. So that's the way I see my life. It's like that, and that's the way music is. You have a beginning, a middle, and an ending. You, where you state what it is, you develop it, and then you recapitulate. So right now, my life, I'm in a recapitulation yeah. of my life. 
and I hope I have an extended coda. I hope you do too, a long <laughs> coda, lots uh, yeah. of repeat signs. Yeah, man. <laughs> okay. So I'm just trying to take all my knowledge and bring it to this point right now and make use of all the pain and suffering and the happiness too that yeah. I've endured. Otherwise, it's been for nothing. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you for your time. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you.